So I'd like to thank you very much for that introduction. And I'd like to really thank you particularly for the honor of giving the Phil Sharp Lecture in Neural Circuits. Um, now there's sort of things that change and things that stay the same over time. And uh, I've known Phil Sharp since he was considerably younger than I am now. <laughs> and some things about Phil have, and looking at these two pictures actually, um, it's remarkable how much some things have not changed. He's really the same person. He's, he's a little blonder than he was then. <laughs> but then so am I. And, um, and, he's, and actually at the time, something that, that some people here might remember, but most probably don't, is that both of us had quite substantial southern accents, which are now largely uh, buried after years in, outside of our homes. But there are certain things that, even while and there are things that change that I think are more surprising. Like I think at that time, no one would have guessed that Phil Sharp would have been head of an institute for brain research. And yet what, would, what you would have predicted and what hasn't changed is that you would have predicted that if he did it, he would do a great job at it. Because Phil is someone who takes things really seriously. And his scientific motto has always been, you know, if you aren't going to do it right, don't do it at all. And that sort of perspective, because Phil was right down the hall from me my first few years of graduate school when I was in the Weinberg lab, was something that really permeated his own lab, his environment, our joint group leadings, um, and his own research over the years. And I think that that is the lesson of MIT, the high standards of MIT are exemplified in Phil's attitude towards science. And um, if I can feel a little bit like I'm sharing in that by giving that lecture, then, then I'll take it. Thank you. I should say Phil was always trying to keep the Weinberg people out of his lab. <laughs> so he thought we were, we were trouble. But, uh, but at the same time, I can remember one of the first important results I had going to show it to Phil because I wanted him to see that, that something had worked because he was that kind of a scientist, that he was everyone's colleague, not just for his own lab. So um, I'm going to talk about how we're thinking about the way that the C. elegans wiring diagram generates behavior. And the thing that drew me to C. elegans as an experimental system um, at the beginning of my postdoc was the publication of a complete wiring diagram of the C. elegans nervous system, a uh, connectome, if you will, of the um, complete set of neurons here. Every, each and every neuron is illustrated here, um, as well as the connections in light gray between them from work of John White and his colleagues. And it, you know, the, the thing that's alluring about this is the idea that you have the entire nervous system of an animal in front of you, and that you should be able, ultimately, to understand everything that animal does based on the properties of those neurons and their interactions with one another. And this is a project that has actually made a great deal of progress in many labs over the time since then. So for example, for most of the neurons at this point in this diagram, we can say something about what kinds of biological functions they have, that there will be some sort of a genetic piece of evidence or, or evidence from an ablation or some other manipulation that tells you this neuron is important for this particular kind of motion, for example. But there are other aspects of the nervous system that are still quite difficult to explain from this wiring diagram. And, and Really, what it is that's going on in the interactions between them has been fundamentally a mystery, even though the individual components have, have, gained, a lot of, have gained a lot of understanding. And it's that question of the interactions across the nervous system that I'm going to focus on today. I should say that this is going to be a talk in honor of its title, completely about neural circuits. I'm not going to talk much, I'm not going to talk at all, I think, about molecules even though um, people in my lab are still very interested in how molecules affect the nervous system. And I would like to particularly point you toward the fact that Stephen Flavel, a postdoc in my lab, will be here next week giving a talk about the roles of neuromodulators in shaping behavior in C. elegans. <laughs> but I'm going to try and, and address this question of how this nervous system gives rise to behavior. And I'm going to start by sort of setting up the thinking about the nervous system that I think actually permeates a great deal of the field, which is that the, the nervous system is wired and set up to generate responses to environmental stimuli. I read a lot of grants that start something about how I want to understand a behavior from sensory input to motor output. And that implies 
some kind of a fixed pathway that gives rise to a behavior. That implies a real relationship between here, as Rene Descartes illustrated, um, some sort of a, a nerve fiber here in the toe that detects the heat of the fire, goes up to the brain, and then generates a signal that will tell you to remove your foot from the fire. Descartes was the first to sort of illustrate this concept of a central location in which sensory information was processed to give rise to behavior. Now, when you work on C. elegans and you have in front of you the wiring diagram, it's very alluring to think of that as the sort of set of instructions for behaviors like this. That when we look at that wiring diagram, we should be able to follow a set of arrows from one point to another and um, lead those directly to things like the, the, the behavior of the organism. And there's certainly a level at which that's true. There are, in fact, many things that we know about the behavior of C. elegans that we can formulate or attempt to formulate in these terms. So the behaviors that my lab studies most and the one I'll focus on today are behaviors that have to do with whether the animal is attracted to or repelled by different kinds of odors in its environment. C. elegans has a very rich sense of smell. It can detect hundreds, probably thousands of different molecules, and it has strong innate behaviors associated with those. So um, small molecules like diacetyl, shown there on the left, are made by bacterial food, and they're highly attractive. If you put a bunch of worms down on a plate, come back an hour later, virtually all of them will have approached that odor. Conversely, um, this long chain molecule here seems to be toxic to the animals, and they avoid it just as assertively as they approach the diacetyl. So these are innate behaviors. They're reliably found in each individual. And um, we've learned quite a bit about how these molecules are detected. So for example, um, when Piali Sengupta was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, she identified the receptor molecule that detects diacetyl, a G protein coupled receptor called odor 10. And that serves as the founding member together with the C. elegans genome, which was emerging at the time, for the olfactory receptor family of C. elegans or families, I should say, there are about 2,000 orphan G protein coupled receptors in the worm genome um, that are in divergent families and expressed in olfactory neurons. So we think that these are um, literally 10% of the genes in the worm are being used to solve the problem of detecting environmental stimuli. Now the way that the worm detects those stimuli is to express these different receptor genes on sensory neurons found in its head, illustrated there in red and in blue. And, um, and the, um, we know that, for example, the neuron that normally detects diacetyl is this blue neuron here. And if diacetyl is no longer detected by this neuron through the loss of this receptor, the animal is no longer attracted to this odor. The repulsive odor is detected by a neuron right next to it. So um, when Emily Trummel was a graduate student in the lab, she did an experiment in which she moved the odor 10 receptor from its normal home to a neuron that normally senses repellent. And what she found was that these transgenic animals were no longer attracted to diacetyl, but they could detect it. And in fact, they were repelled, showing a behavior appropriate for a different olfactory neuron, the one in which it was now expressed. And so this, too, really fits the idea of an innate odor preference, and it even gives you a sense that that odor preference is encoded all the way out to the periphery, where the attractive or repulsive valence of an odor is directly encoded by the sensory neuron that detects a receptor. This idea of innate preferences seems to apply um, to the sensory systems of more complex animals as well. Um, a nice example comes from the work of Charles Zucker and Nick Reba looking at mammalian taste sensation. And their work on characterizing the taste cells of the mammalian tongue shows that different taste cells express different receptors, either for attractive or repulsive tastings, and that merely activating those neurons in the periphery is sufficient to give you either an acceptance or a rejection behavior by rodents. So here we also have an example of an innate preference that seems to be encoded all the way out to the periphery that leads to an innate and reliable behavioral response. Now, this idea is very useful in looking at peripheral sensory neurons. Um, but as a way of thinking about behavior, it actually overemphasizes, I think, an aspect of behavior, which is its sort of reliability and reproducibility. Because in fact, one of the most obvious features of behavior, when you look at it in any organism, is its variability. So I, my own 
personal um, favorite example of this is uh, inspired by Michael Fee's work and by other work in the field of songbirds. So songbirds um, generate, learn, and produce a song um, that they enable to attract their mates. And it turns out that this song is normally very reliable, but both during learning and later in life, this song can be more variable or less variable, not just because the animal is incapable of singing a better song, but because variability is actively injected into the song. And the idea here is the following. If you're trying to generate a motor behavior, and you're trying to do that, for example, by trial and error, if you aren't trying to do different things, you will not explore the different kinds of mechanisms that will enable you to make a proper song. And so practicing and varying the outcome will lead to better outcomes, either during learning or actually later in life. Here, an example, the variability of a songbird song is actually influenced not only during learning, but actually in a mature songbird based on whether he's singing to a female or just practicing on his own. And a specific brain region called L-man is um, actively required to generate this variability into a song circuit. It's not just a sub-threshold performance. Variability is something that is being actively generated and by a particular brain region and placed in the motor pathway. So this idea of variability as an important feature of learning and of certain behaviors also finds, um, finds incarnation in certain kinds of behaviors that incorporate variability as an essential component of how they work. And it turns out that hemotaxis, the simple attraction to odor, while it is completely or largely predictable on a whole animal level, is a behavior that is variable or unpredictable on an instant-to-instant -instant level. And um, this we can see if we just look at animals trying to respond to an odor. We see them take various different paths to get there. It's not as though they simply turn directly into the odor and perform properly. And work originally by Sean Lockery's lab developed a theoretical and experimental framework for this that showed that, in fact, the animals approach odor in part using a naturally variable strategy, a strategy called the biased random walk. And the strategy of this, which was first worked out for bacterial chemotaxis by Howard Burke and his colleagues at Harvard University, is that the animal um, moves through the environment, not detecting the absolute direction of odor, but simply paying attention to whether odor is increasing or decreasing. If conditions are getting better and odor is increasing, the animal will continue to move in the direction it's currently moving. But if, it's, if, but if the conditions are not getting better, the animal will change directorate direction and try a new direction for some period of time to see if conditions will get better if it moves in this new direction. So what this means is that the animal approaches the odor through a path that's not predictable. And furthermore, the turns are random. They're made in random directions and varying in time, although the rate of turns is predictable. The time that any particular turn is generated is not. But this general kind of strategy, which is sort of, if, if it's working, keep doing it. If it's not working, do something else is actually very useful in many aspects of life. And um, it's useful to the worm in particular. And there's actually theory, foraging theory, that suggests that it's actually one of the best ways to track to an odor in an environment that's noisy or an environment that you can't control. But in any case, there's sort of a general question that this, this raises, which is what there are here are probabilities of turns. How do you change something in the environment, a signal about odor, into a probability, into something that will happen or not happen? What's happening to flip the coin to cause something to occur at a particular time? So um, studying these behaviors, um, studies of these behaviors and of related behaviors in my lab and in a variety of other labs, um, including Arabi Samuels and Yun Zhang uh, at Harvard, have identified a set of neurons downstream of olfactory neurons that are important in controlling this behavior. So this is sort of a first order circuit for this probabilistic turning behavior downstream of an olfactory neuron called AWC, which is the main olfactory neuron that directs a lot of these biased random walk behaviors. So the AWC neuron, um, and this is actually, I want to make a couple of points about this. The first is that this is the way that most people draw the worm wiring diagram. It's a hierarchical feed-forward kind of model where information starts with a sensory neuron, a triangle at the top, and ends with motor output pathways, which are these circles at the bottom. 
that the sensory neuron actually converges with other sensory input on a series of what are thought of as integrating inner neurons for sensory information. And those are those four red blue cells, the AI cells. And these cells here are coordinated regulators of different kinds of turning behavior. Um, so they can stimulate the rates of different kinds of turns or inhibit them based on whichever one they are. Um, and they can actually affect the rates of several different kinds of turns in, in concert. So they affect direct reversals. They affect the kind of U-turn the worm makes called an omega bend or an omega turn. And they can also affect the amplitude of the sine wave that the animal makes as it's moving along which will help it curve toward or away from an odor. So this circuit here is what we would like at some level to understand when we try to understand um, when the animal is responding to odor. How is information flowing from the sensory neuron to the motor output? That is sort of the question that, that is raised by this wiring diagram in particular and by wiring diagrams in general. So the first, th so in order to address this, we wanted to develop a really well-controlled situation where we could reliably deliver the same odor stimulus to animals over and over again and ascertain their behaviors. So the problem with, the good thing about letting an animal move freely in a gradient is that it's a natural behavior. The bad thing is that each animal is determining its own experience as it moves. And so you don't know necessarily what the important parameters are. And so, um, in the lab, Dirk Ulbricht, when he was a postdoc, spent some time developing methods that would allow us to deliver stimuli to animals in a very reliable and reproducible pattern and then observe their behaviors. And this is, I would say, something that we sort of take a little bit from the, the monkey psychophysicists, actually, who were the first to really point out the importance of bringing quantitative uh, methods to neuroscience in studying behavior. So we've moved that model way down to the worm level. And we do that um, by allowing the animals to move within little microfluidic devices. Um, and in these microfluidic devices, we can deliver different kinds of stimuli. And this movie here is going to show you a number of C. elegans moving around in a microfluidic device um, while different kinds of substances are flowed past them. So um, these animals are moving around. You can see that sometimes they change orientation, sometimes they move around. And this dark color here is the appearance of an attractive odor, uh, isoamyl alcohol. And the light color is when it was taken away. And when the isoamyl alcohol appears, the animals mm -hmm. move in long straight lines. And when it's taken away, they turn. And so the, the odor appears, the animals move in long lines, they suppress turning, the odor disappears, the animals start turning again. So this is the behavior pattern that is predicted by the bias random walk model. And in this case, it's a behavior pattern that you can generate reliably over and over again to look at the animal's response, not just in a qualitative way, but in a quantitative <coughs> way to ask what happens. And so using these methods, um, followed by automated analysis of the behavior, where we track the animals and automatically score all these different kinds of reorientations, we can look at the responses of the animals here you're looking at the responses of about 250 animals to a 15-minute sequence of odor addition and removal on various schedules. And the, each line is a single animal. Each color trace represents a particular behavioral pattern. And what you can see here is that the animals do suppress turns when odors are present. And they do enhance turning when odor is removed. But that um, these responses are quantitative and not qualitative. The rate of turning never goes down to zero, and the rate of turning never goes up to 100%. And you can manipulate this experiment in many ways, and you always get that same result. That the bottom of the curve is at about 10% turning, and the top of the curve is about 80% turning. There's always a probability of failure and a probability of success. So you can ask, so the question we wanted to ask is, well, why is that? Why isn't this response completely reliable? We have this animal. Every animal has 302 neurons. Why are they performing sometimes and not others? And so one idea could be that some animals don't develop properly or that there's something wrong with them or that there's something about the number of trials or about alternating trials. So one of the things about this kind of a quantitative assay is that you can score the same animal over and over again on trial after trial and ask whether it responds or not. And here's an experiment in which Dirk did that, categorizing different kinds of responses to the odor stimulus, 24 trials, 23 animals, and what you can see in this checkerboard is that all of the animals responded sometimes and not other times. All of the animals are showing a probabilistic behavior pattern. So a single animal's behavior varies from trial to trial. And these trials are just a minute apart. So this poses a question for us. 
we have an olfactory neuron. We have a reversal behavior. We know that, the, that there's a neuron um, long known in C. elegans to be important in reversal behavior called the backward command neuron. And we have a reversal behavior. Why is it that sometimes you get a reversal and sometimes you don't? And actually, the shortest direct path from the olfactory neuron to the backward command neuron is a through path. There's actually one direct synapse even from the sensory neuron. There are a lot of indirect synapses through this neuron AIB. And then there are a lot of other indirect routes to the command neuron as well. You can see all of these arrows indicating that these guys are heavily connected. And the neuron I want you to focus on, the neuron I'm going to focus on. I'm sorry to interrupt. To AIB. I think your mic might be off, and I don't want anybody else to miss your talk about this. There you go. The other way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not starting over. <laughs> okay, so there are many through paths from the odor to the behavior. And, um, but the ones I'm going to focus, you can see that you can actually, these neurons are heavily connected. There are many ways of getting from point to point. And I'm just really going to focus on these neurons here. And we selected them because they represent the largest number of synapses when you just sort of count through the connectome and say these look like they might be important. Um, and they were supported by experimental evidence. So just starting from the beginning, um, the first question in order to answer that question is that we want to be able to look at neuronal variability and behavioral variability at the same time. And this is another version of the microfluidic device that Dirk developed. This one here. This one here is one that enables us to simultaneously monitor calcium imaging, in this case in the AWC neuron, which is that little spot there by the star. And when the AWC neuron, um, so this animal can be, moved, can be moved freely while we deliver odor to it. We can monitor the presence of odor, the fluorescence of the signal, and the behavior of the animal simultaneously. And what this animal did, this little um, peak here, which corresponds to the removal of odor, was associated with that little reorientation maneuver there in red. So we can do this experiment um, not just once, but many times. So for example, you can take a single animal and 80 times in a row expose it to exactly the same stimulus, look at the behavior, and look at the response to the neuron. And what you see is that the neuron here in these heat maps, um, the brighter colors, the yellower colors, indicates a response to odor. Actually, it's odor removal that seems to happen pretty reliably. But the interesting question is not just whether this neuron responds reliably, but how on a trial-to-trial -trial level, and not on average, it responds to different kinds of stimuli. And so we can actually do that by taking those movies that I told you and separating them out based on what behavior the animal did in a particular trial, grouping together the responses in which the animals did a large reorientation, which is in red, a small reorientation, which is in black, or simply fail to respond to the odor at all, which is in gray. And then we can line up the different um, responses of the olfactory neuron in all of those trials and average them. And what you can see is that there is really no change between the response of the olfactory neuron depending on what the animal did. In fact, these three curves are absolutely superimposable. So the olfactory neuron knew in every trial that the odor was added and removed, but the animal failed to respond in a subset of trials. So somewhere other than the olfactory neuron, there's a change in behavior. Now conversely, you can go to the very end of this pathway and look at the so-called backward command neuron. You can look at its activity in freely moving animals. And what you find is that it's not perhaps quite as reliable, but that 90% of the time, if the animal is making a reversal, this neuron is increasing in activity. And 90% of the time, if the animal is terminating a reversal, this neuron is dropping. And this result has been seen by a number of different groups. So we now have, we can sort of simplify the circuit down to the following elements. We have a sensory neuron. We have the backward that responds to odor, the backward command neurons that synchronize with reversals. How do we get the uncoupling between them? So the first thing I should say is that when I said the sensory neuron was active, that was um, what I was reporting to you was the change in fluorescence in the cell body based on genetically encoded calcium indicators. And that is not necessarily a great indicator of the neuron's potential. So the first thing we wanted to ask, which is actually an idea that's very prominent in the synaptic plasticity field, is whether the release probability of this neuron was in some way being regulated. Um, there's a lot of ideas about unreliable synapses or regulation of presynaptic release. And to get at those, um, Donovan Ventimiglia, a graduate student in the lab, 
developed a set of reagents that he could use to, in a cell type specific way, monitor the synapses of the AWC neuron. And these are um, cell type specific GFP based reagents. One of them is a calcium sensor that is not generically expressed everywhere in the cell body, but rather specifically localized to the synapse by fusing it to um, the synaptic vesicle protein synaptogyrin. And the other one, developed originally by Gero Miesenbach and then subsequently modified by Rob Edwards, is a um, pH sensitive green fluorescent protein that is fused to the vesicular glutamate transporter. It labels glutamate containing synaptic vesicles. And when they fuse with the plasma membrane and the pH changes from low to high, this molecule becomes fluorescent. So we can use this as a direct measure of glutamate vesicle exocytosis. The sensory neuron is glutamatergic. And so when Donovan, so Donovan looked at those two in the AWC olfactory neurons to ask, first of all, how does synaptic calcium relate to cell body calcium? And second, how do exoendocytosis uh, relate to the signals we see in the cell body? And the answer is that as far as we can tell, these neurons do respond reliably um, at their synapses and in terms of synaptic vesicle release. Now the reliable gets an asterisk there because these animals could not move freely. In order to measure these much smaller signals, we had to physically immobilize them. But we do see very similar signals um, in, the, in the axon as we see in the cell body, except that they're somewhat faster actually. And the um, signatures of vesicle release show exactly the patterns of endocytosis and exocytosis that would be predicted to be associated with um, a suppression of vesicle release when calcium is low and an enhancement of calcium. Uh, vesicle release when calcium is high. So we think, based on this, that probably the sensory neuron is signaling at the synapse and releasing glutamate. So now, let's go downstream to the next level of neurons. So we can look at the direct postsynaptic target of AWC. This is the neuron AIB. And then we can look through to the backward command neuron, ABA. Now here on the left, um, we can see the average responses that these neurons have to odor. And what you can see is that I'm going to focus on the response to odor onset. It's stronger um, behaviorally and easier to monitor. And what you can see is that AWC has a very sharp, very reliable response. You see a suppression of responses in the AIB neuron. And you see a suppression of responses in the AVA neuron as well. So at some level, information is flowing through this pathway. And you can see that there are nice sort of small error bars around this signal, which make you think that everything is going well. But this is actually the problem with looking at average responses. Because remember, we're not really interested in the average response here. We're interested in the variability. We're interested in why sometimes the behavior happens and sometimes it doesn't. And that becomes more interesting if you look at these individual traces. Um, and the heat maps here actually indicate to you that the average responses shown there on the left have small error bars just because you keep expanding the numbers, you can make any error bar really small. Um, so in fact, there's a lot of variability. But, and specifically, if you look at the calcium responses in the sensory neuron, every single time you add odor, it just crashes down to the baseline and stays there. But these neurons here have a lot of neurons, have a lot of examples that just don't change activity at all at the individual level. So he decided to think about what that meant a little more and to look a little more carefully at those traces. And now I'm going to show you what the single traces look like, um, just directly monitoring calcium instead of as a heat map. And the first thing that struck us about them when we looked at them, um, which we had, again, missed by averaging, is that in fact, when we look at the inner neurons, and this is different from the sensory neurons, we see that they have highly bistable behavior. They have either high or low activity, but they spend very little time in between. They seem to be jumping back and forth between high and low calcium states. And we see this sort of characteristic bistability in all three of the inner neurons. So now let's reanalyze um, the three inner neurons inner neurons, and I actually showed you just the first one to begin with, but now we're going to look at all three of them individually. And we're going to categorize each of the neurons based on whether it's in a low state or a high state at the beginning of the experiment, and then ask what happened when you added odor. And what you can see is that the main effect of odor addition, which happens at the same time in each trial, is to induce transitions from high states to low states. The neuron is already in a low state, nothing happens. And, but the neuron only transitions from the high to a low state a set percentage at the time. So there's a group of animals in which that happens right on the line, and then a group in which it doesn't. And the number in each case varies slightly from neuron to neuron. 
And we can quantify this reliability by organizing these traces. And basically the result is that if we look at the sensory neuron, 100% of the time we see an odor response. And if we look at the first downstream neuron, we only see a response 60% of the time. And if we get down to the backward command neuron, we see a response about 45% of the time. And based on the conditions we're using here, that's actually a pretty good match to how well this neuron would be responding, how well this animal would be responding to, to the odor behaviorally. So we're seeing a drop in the transmission of this signal across these synapses. So what's happening to make the synex signal drop? Um, first, I'm going to tell you one other thing, the next thing that we looked at. So Andrew Gordas, a postdoc in the lab, developed ways of recording from several of these neurons simultaneously, um, looking at all three of the neurons in this network downstream of the sensory neuron. And when he looked at these three neurons simultaneously, he found, as he had seen originally, that they were bistable. They tended to be either high or low and to jump between those states. But it's not just that they all tend to jump between those states. They tend to jump between those states at the same time. These neurons are highly correlated with one another. Even the jitter in these responses, as well as the overall level, seems to be strongly related across time. And these are just a few representative traces looking over different times. These are actually in buffer. There's no odor present. It's a spontaneous movement of these neurons between active and inactive states. And Andrew looked at these states for a large number of different animals, adding up to many hours of monitoring neural activity. And what he found is that if you imagine that there are three neurons, each of which can have two different states, there are eight possible activity states within the network. And only three of those eight activity states were basically represented at all within the activity of these neurons within the error of our measurement noise. Those could be either all three of the neurons off all three of the neurons on, or just this one neuron downstream of the sensory neuron on, the AIB neuron. The other five states, um, as far as we could tell, just didn't happen under these recording conditions. So this is giving us a clue that these neurons are actually acting together in some sort of a collective process. And it's also giving us another way of categorizing the data I was showing you, right? I said that we could look at the response of a neuron based on whether it was on or off. We can also look at a contingent response. We can ask, we can look at the response of this neuron based on whether the other neurons are on and off. And when Andrew did that, um, first when he looked at all three of the neurons together, when all three of them were on, actually they tended to respond together as shown in those individual traces. And when all three of them were on, basically between 40 and 50% of the time, they responded to odor. So this is an unreliable response to odor, um, indicated by the top guys responding, the bottom guys not. But when only the AIB neuron was on when odor was added, it responded completely reliably to odor. Every time we added the odor, this neuron gave a response and plummeted down to its lowest baseline level. So this suggests to us that we have a way of categorizing the responses. We can start to predict something about the network by knowing more than just the state of one neuron at the time that the signal arrives. So that's a correlation. It's very interesting. We saw similar correlations with certain kinds of mutants that would um, alter the activity in this network. Um, but we wanted to go about testing directly whether that activity pattern was actually responsible for something about the variability we saw in the network. And to do that, we used a um, chemogenetic reagent developed by Naveen Pokola in the lab, which took, takes advantage of the fact that C. elegans does not use histamine as a neurotransmitter. And so we can create a false neurotransmitter, a dread-like molecule, for those of you working in mammals, um, by making it sensitive to a transmitter that does not produce. And the thing that's nice about expressing the histamine-gated chloride channel in a neuron and silencing it is that um, you can feed the animals histamine, they take it up, and within a couple of minutes, you see a very strong response uh, in whatever neuron that you want to see. We also see really nice silencing electrophysiologically. That's, that's rapidly reversible. So we can use the histamine-gated chloride channel in this context to um, silence individual neurons in the network and ask whether if we artificially create the activity state that we're interested in, can we then recreate the response to odor that we would have seen in that activity state? Is it sufficient? And so what Andrew did was to, um, again, record simultaneously from the three different neurons, and then in this case, silence these two neurons, RAM and ADA, 
using the histamine-gated chloride channel. And you can see that within five minutes, they're completely silent. And they remain silent. This is an intact animal. Um, but the AIB neuron is still going on and off with its normal pattern. So it hasn't been apparently affected too much by this. And, but when we add odor, we now see a really highly reliable response in AIB to odor. So silencing the downstream neurons has made AIB from an unreliable to a reliable odor-responding neuron. So that suggests that this activity state is really instructive to the network. One of the fun things about having a genetic reagent is that we can not only look at the normal activity states, but we can generate those other activity states that never exist in nature, where any one of the neurons is silent, for example, or any two of the neurons are silent. And so by doing those, Andrew asked what other neurons were important in generating reliability in the AIB odor response. And what he found um, was that if he silenced this intermediate neuron here, RIM, the um, AIB response, as shown here, becomes completely reliable. But even more interesting than that, at that point, the AVA response also becomes completely reliable. So he switched this network now um, from a state where this neuron would have responded rather unreliably to odor to one in which it responds every time. It's as though RAM is a distraction from whatever the animal is trying to do. And um, he can change this experiment around a little bit by instead of silencing RAM with the histamine-gated channel, silencing the RAM chemical synapses with tetanus toxin. And the reason for doing that is that you can do that and still maintain looking at the activity of all three of the neurons. And all three of the neurons still work under those conditions. But if RAM chemical synapses are silent, all three of them are now almost completely reliable. The whole network has been switched into a network now where all of these neurons respond to odor onset every time odor appears. If they're, in the, if they're on the upstate. So what do we think this means? We think that these results mean um, just one way of interpreting this is that we know that the um, AIB neuron is immediately downstream of the sensory neurons. And it's always been regarded as sort of a collecting sensory inner neuron. But what these results suggest is that this neuron is receiving information, feedback, from further downstream systems. And the neurons that it's receiving information from are neurons that are more directly involved in motor outputs. I didn't emphasize this, but RAM is not only between AIB and AVA. RAM is itself a motor neuron that affects several muscles. So the fact that RAM activity can affect AIB activity indicates that we're pushing information from the motor circuit back up into the sensory integrating neurons. So basically what the data show are that the sensory neuron responds reliably to odors, that this second neuron can respond either to odor or to the network state as expressed by the activity of these downstream neurons. And then you reach the AVA neuron that's active during every reversal. The key element that couples AIB to AVA and the reversal state is RAM, or that uncouples it. These experiments are all based on just monitoring neural activity. The next question you should be asking yourself is whether these neurons are actually active in the same way in the natural behaviors that the animal shows, and whether this pattern of activity that we're observing um, is actually relevant to the way that the animal, to, to, to what the animal would be doing in its behavioral decisions. So the first thing we did, so the experiments where we imaged all neurons simultaneously, again, had to be done in immobilized animals. It's just sort of a limit of where we are with respect to the optics and the indicators and what we can do. But we can look at each of these neurons individually in free-moving animals. And we can monitor, as I showed you for the sensory neuron, the activity of the neuron and the behavior of the animal. And so what we see when we do that for each of these four neurons in isolation is that, in fact, the circuit is both a sensory circuit and a motor circuit in freely moving animals. Why do I say that? If we look at um, the animals being exposed to odor stimuli, shown here at the top, we can see a strong effect in the sensory neuron, and we can see a kind of wobbly, variable response in each of the three downstream inner neurons that moves in the same direction. Not so different from the average response I showed you when we looked at the calcium traces. Um, when, but if we look at spontaneous behavior, what we see is that these three neurons are also active at the same time um, with actually very small error bars in the context of spontaneous behavioral transitions. 
So um, all three of these neurons become active when the animal is transitioning to a reversal. All three of these neurons become less active when the animal is transitioning from a reversal to forward movement. Now, we really believe that these are spontaneous behavioral states, that these represent the coupled motor state, in part because if we look at the sensory neuron, we do not see those correlations. The sensory neuron is maintaining its own, in this case, um, rather low level of activity, while these neurons are going back and forth um, synchronously with the behavior of the animal. Second question, um, is this pattern of activity and reliability um, something important in what the animal does? So to do that, we took some of the same manipulations that we had done to manipulate um, activity in neural imaging and asked whether those affected the behavior of the animal. So in this experiment, what we did was to silence the RAM neurons in animals that were moving in odor. And we took them, we measured their behavior under conditions in which the odor response is variable, like those conditions that I showed you earlier. In this case, the addition of odor transitions animals toward moving forward. About 50% of the animals move forward. And if we silence the RAM neuron, the animals now move forward much more reliably. They actually become more sensitive to odor through this neuron being removed. And that's the prediction that's made by the circuitry and the imaging responses we saw. So this seems to indicate that this neuron is responsible both for reliability of neuronal responses and reliability of behavioral responses. So just to conclude, um, what do we think this means? We think that we've been thinking about this particular sensory circuit um, as, as having a, as sort of propagating information forward from the sensory neurons to various kinds of motor pathways. What our results suggest is that actually it doesn't just matter what the sensory input is for what a behavior is going to be. What matters is the state of the circuit when sensory information arrives. That the motor circuits are spontaneously moving back and forth between different activity states. Some of those states are responsive to sensory inputs and some of them are not. Now I've, um, we, I, I've told you about three of those neurons in this, in this circuit motif. Um, I'm bringing this slide back up, though, to remind you that these three neurons are just three out of a fairly large number of neurons, even within this submotif of the 302 neurons in the worm's nervous system. So the first thing I want to say about this is that I don't think there's any reason to think that the manipulations we did are sort of a unique solution to this problem. We seem to have two kinds of inputs, a sensory and a motor input that can drive the circuit. But some of these other neurons might also be capable of tipping that in, that particular input from one side or the other. And in fact, I think it's very likely that this entire network of neuron is involved in making the decision. I think the most likely um, way to think about what this result might mean is that the sensory neurons are in fact accurately reporting sensory information, that different kinds of motor neurons are capable of generating particular motor outputs, um, which again, they tend to do in a dedicated way. But the level in between is basically one network, that it's an, that it's an interconnected network, um, and that the decisions are being made collectively by the neurons at that level. And one of the reasons I think that is um, the kinds of results I showed you and some other results from the lab. And another reason I think that is based on some experiments recently published by Ali Pasha Vaziri and Manuel Zimmer's labs, in which they um, simultaneously monitored the activity of about 100 neurons in the brain of a worm. In this case, not necessarily linked to behavior. And again, just sort of watching spontaneously what the activity of those neurons were doing. And what they observed when they did that was that um, there were quite a few neurons within that that had activity that was obviously correlated with each other. That there were neurons that were becoming active at the same time and turning off at the same time. And while they don't know what most of those neurons were, at least two of them were the two AVA neurons, the backward command neurons. And there was reason to think that at least one of the other ones was AIB. So this network probably consists not just of the couple of neurons I showed you, not just of the six neurons represented by those three pairs, but probably something more like 30 neurons, probably 10% of the nervous system or possibly even more tends to become active and inactive in a correlated way. And the other thing that emerges from their analysis, again, this is still very early, um, but I think it's extremely thought provoking for us, is that there are other um, there are other groups of neurons that tend to become active together. 
that the neurons are not acting independently of one another. There are not 302 independent units of information in this, in this diagram, but rather smaller sets of neurons um, with different kinds of correlations and anti-correlations to each other. So we think there may be a menu of collective activity states that the animal is choosing between, and that these in turn are determining the sensitivity to sensory inputs. So, um, I, so just to sort of generalize this idea and bring it out a little more to um, other nervous systems, one of the, so one of the things I told you basically is that what we think of as a sensory circuit is sensitive to motor activity and circuit states of the animal. And in fact, um, if you look at the literature in different animals, in ranging from flies to humans, there's evidence that different kinds of general slowly acting circuit states affect the processing of sensory information, including sensory detection and sensory gain. And so I've used three examples of that to show examples of how what we think of as really a sensory system is affected by the motor, the motor state of the animal on a rapid second-to-second um, -second level. The first is from my colleague Garrett, Gabby Maimon, looking at visually responsive neurons in the fly optic flow sensing system showing that the gain of their response is much greater when the fly is flying than when the fly is resting. So the sensory response is, is affected by the motor response. At pretty much the same time as this paper came out, there's a paper from Chris Neal and Michael Stryker showing exactly the same thing in orientation selective um, neurons in V1 visual cortex in the mouse. But the gain of these responses was affected by the spontaneous movement of the animal. The animal spontaneously starts moving, and the gain of its visual responses increases. So there are motor signals in visual cortex. And in fact, later, Tobias Bonhoeffer's lab showed that even if the mouse is in complete darkness, you can see the motor signals moving in and out of visual cortex in sort of spontaneous activity. And finally, an example from humans. Um, fMRI studies of humans performing visual detection tasks shows that in association with these visual detection tasks, there are sort of large, slow changes of activity in visual cortex here on the order of 10 seconds. And these changes do not affect whether, these changes are not affected by whether the target is present or absent, but they predict how, whether the human will correctly perceive the target. That these large scale changes in activity are actually helping to affect your perception of weak visual stimuli. So the idea that these sensory systems are absorbing information from other states of the animal, I think, is um, one with broad, broad, broad analogies. And this really brings me back to the bird, which is where I started. Um, in some ways, the, you know, to me, one of the big lessons of the bird song system is that sensory circuits are also motor circuits. That when you look at the same circuit from different perspectives, in particular, the song producing system of the songbird. If you look at that system in an anesthetized or sleeping bird, it's completely driven by auditory stimuli. It really is tuned to the bird's own song and it responds to the bird's own song. When the bird is awake, it's a motor system. It responds only to motor inputs and to the drive of the animal's behavior. So I think it's uh, um, recognizing that these systems are not separate, but actually that the brain is performing collective and collaborative tasks in which the different systems are interrelated with one another. I think is, is one we can learn from the bird and think about in other settings. And finally, um, one of the things that, that I think that this points out is the importance of different things that are going on in the nervous system on different time scales. So when we've been studying sensory neurons in general, or in fact, um, in many different kinds of studies in neuroscience, we always focus on the first, the fastest, the very rapid processing of information. And you know, in these cases, we're often looking at things that happen in milliseconds or even microseconds as we look at the action of channels or of synapses. Um, certainly when we look at sensory responses and we look at their timing, we're looking in very small time domains. But these, um, this information is being superimposed on slower endogenous activity states of the nervous system. That the kind of circuit states which, um, or attractor-like states that we see in collective groups of neurons are evolving on slower time scales, perhaps 10 times slower than the time scales of sensory inputs, and can yet change the time scale of sensory inputs. And um, other kinds of variability, for example, can be generated by neuromodulators in association with motivational states on even slower time scales, time scales of minutes to hours. So these will be shaping the response to sensory time scales in a dynamic and flexible way, 
um, even before sort of long-term effects like plasticity or, or development or learning take place. And so with that, I will just um, thank you and show you some of the people in the lab who did this work. Um, I was talking mostly about work done to try to understand variability done by Andrew Gordas here in the bow tie. Um, my lab is always extremely well dressed. <laughs> and um, and um, the work on looking directly at synapses, AWC synapses and their reliability was done by Donovan Ventimiglia, a graduate student, Naveen Pokola, a postdoc here in the tie, the DNA tie, um, developed some of the reagents like the histamine gated chloride channel. Um, Dirk Albrecht in Johannes Larsch, the two blondes in the back row there, um, developed the methods for simultaneous calcium imaging and behavior. And um, just hidden here a little bit is Steve Flavel, who will be here next week to tell you about neuromodulation. Thank you.